Thank you, Jesus. Stay on your feet for a minute. <laughs> this has got to be the happiest place on planet Earth. When the saints get to come together and we get to celebrate the almost too good to be true news. But it is true. Put your hand on your heart for a minute. It's so true. I want you to consider the gospel for a minute, the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that God became a human being and dwelt amongst us, that he took on human flesh and was tempted in every way as you're tempted, yet without sin, so that he can identify with our weaknesses. He's not a God who can't identify with human suffering and human pain. He can identify with your pain, with your suffering. He can identify with your human experience. This is our God who chose to humble himself to that point, to be a baby, to be completely dependent upon his mother, and ultimately humble enough to go to the cross. This, this God, just consider for a minute, he's so powerful he can get legions of angels to come to his defense. And yet he's silent. As they beat him and they strip his clothes and they mock him and they say, if you're really the son of God, tell us who's hitting you as, he, as they blindfolded him. And yet he was silent. As a lamb is silent before the slaughter for this purpose, he knew he had come to do the father's will, to seek and to save that which was lost, which was you and I. Just let the, the simple gospel begin to tenderize your heart and rejoice in your heart. This is the extent that he would go, that he would go to the cross as they're rolling dice at the foot of the cross and they're gambling over his clothes. He's looking up and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he forgives your sins as he dies on the cross. But after three days, just like he said he would do, he resurrected from the dead. And many people saw him and they stuck their hands in his wounds on his side and the holes in his hands. And many people testified that they, they witnessed the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he's alive today, seated at the right hand of the Father. And you're here tonight because of the mercy of God. As David testified in Psalm 103, he's merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in mercy. This is our God. This is his ways. He's good. Say that with me. He's good. good. Say, God is good. good. <laughs> Listen, this good news, he says this. This is the Apostle Paul at the revelation of Jesus. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Say that with me. <laughs> not life, nor death, nor angel, nor principality. Nothing, nothing. Say nothing. nothing. Come on, if that doesn't make you happy, I don't know what will. Listen, he says, if, if, if God is for you, who can be against you? Listen, he works some things out for your good, right? Come on, say all. all. He works all things out for your good. Come on, it's true. I like this declaration. You guys got this stuff. Man, I, I'm so excited. Father, we just thank you so much. We thank you so much for this company of people gathered in your name. And with God, there is nothing that is impossible. Father, as I preach your gospel, Lord, demonstrate the truth of it by stretching out your hands and performing signs, wonders, and miracles. That folks' faith would not be in the wisdom of man, not in wise and persuasive words, but in the power of God. Lord, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. Any faith that we have, you authored it. Lord, release an atmosphere of faith in the building tonight for the greater miracles, God, for the, for, the, for the miracles that people have been pressing in for years and yet have not received it yet. Lord, let there be a spirit of breakthrough, God. We, rele we receive the angelic help. Father, you've sent to us angels, ministers of flames of fire that are sent to minister on behalf of those who will inherit salvation. Lord, we thank you for the angels that are present to perform miracles in the name and for the glory of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for creative miracles taking place right now. Deaf ears opening up in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Open up deaf ears now in Jesus' mighty name. Spinal injuries be healed right now in Jesus' name. Somebody, you've had an injury in your left ankle for many years that never healed right. God is healing you right now. Go ahead and try to do something you couldn't do before. Uh, moving it around, jump 
jump up and down on it. I want uh, to tell you in a minute, I'm going to keep ministering here because I feel this atmosphere of faith as I preach the gospel. You, you understand that if you want to see miracles, preach the gospel because the Holy Spirit backs up the preaching of the gospel. <laughs> he confirms the message of the gospel by performing miracles and signs and wonders. And so when we preach the gospel, who wants to be empowered? See, when you preach the gospel, this is what we're empowered by the Holy Spirit to do. He confirms it with miracles and signs and wonders. So I can feel faith just because I preach the simple gospel in five minutes. And so we're going to keep pressing into that. But I want to encourage you, if God begins to heal you tonight, at any point in the service, you don't have to wait until the end. If God begins to heal you, you have permission to be healed at any time. Like the moment that you feel faith, take it fast. Say, take it fast. Don't wait to be healed. The moment that you, that you feel faith, put your hand on the issue that you need healing for. Begin to test it out. I know how much faith is in the room by how much I see movement. If I see movement, if I see people moving, then I can, I can tell there's faith because people are testing it out. And, and so if God begins to heal you and you begin to feel the presence of God healing you or you can feel breakthrough, I want you to begin to wave your hands at me and I'll bless what God does. We'll just bless what he does. So we bless it right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. We bless the healing that's taking place. We bless the healing in the back that's taking place right now. Bless this. Bless it, Lord, in Jesus' name. At any point in the night, if you begin to feel healing, just wave your hands. And that's what that's doing is you're contributing to an atmosphere of faith. Do you understand that? You're giving glory to God. You're testifying God is in the room. And other people will see you testify, and they'll begin to believe even more that if God is touching you in the room, he'll touch them. How many people want tonight to be a night of breakthrough? You know, I'm believing that tonight's going to be a night of breakthrough for many people. There's people who have been pressing in for a breakthrough for many years, and you haven't received your miracle yet, but tonight's your night. Somebody, you need healing in your right eye. Just put your hand on your right eye in Jesus' name. Father, we speak healing to the right eye right now. Uh, Father, we thank you for healing. It's like almost like a burning sensation in the right eye. Something happened in your right eye. Father, we thank you for healing the right eye. All allergies be healed in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for that. We thank you for what you're doing, God. We thank you for healing digestive issues. I had an intercessor reach out to me today. She had a dream about me last night. And uh, she said I was preaching and there were people that were lining up, especially young people that were lining up to my left. She said I was in the dream. I walked into the place where Richie was preaching. There was a line of people on my left and I could see words on their back like I hate myself, pornography, self-cutting, addict to drugs. Then I saw a man dressed in full white. Who do you think that is? On Richie's right side, when they came up to you for prayer, Richie would give them this great big bear hug, and they would fall down crying. I woke up crying, just praying in tongues. That was last night. I had a dream last night, and in the dream, Jesus said to me, unless you sacrifice yourself, you can't love. Then I woke up, and God was speaking to me, Colossians 4, 6, about speaking and having it seasoned with salt. I believe that tonight, something significant is going to happen in your life and in my life. If you have any of those things uh, kind of hovering over you that I read about, that suicide, self-hatred, pornography, all that stuff, right now, in the name of Jesus, I declare Freedom. Freedom. Freedom from anxiety, freedom from depression, freedom from self-hatred. Sometimes people are pressing in for healing, and what they need is deliverance. I believe that the finger of God is present to heal, but also to bring deliverance, to set free tonight. Father, we, we come against every demonic, tormenting spirit that's been lying, and I pray for freedom. 
in the name of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus and declare that the blood of Jesus is enough to break every generational curse, to break every curse in your life. In the name of Jesus, we declare the blood, the blood, the blood, the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. The blood of Jesus speaks better than the blood of Abel. The blood of Jesus cries out mercy. The blood of Jesus, I speak the blood of Jesus right now. Jesus said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of Jesus forgives your sins as far as the east is from the west, so far as God removed them from you because of the blood of Jesus. He doesn't even remember them anymore. Every spirit of condemnation that has come against the body of Christ, we take authority over it now, and we speak that the ears would hear the Father's voice. No longer would the dominant voice be the voice of condemnation, but the dominant voice would be the voice of the Father. May you receive the hug of the Father, the hug of Jesus. In Jesus' name, be healed, be whole, be well. I bless the tears. I see many people crying right now. I bless the tears. One of the main manifestations that we'll see of a move of the Holy Spirit, when God begins to move, when the Holy Spirit begins to move, is tears. Father, I bless the tears. Father, I bless the tenderness in the room, the tenderness in, in, that's happening in people's heart. God is tenderizing people's heart right now. Father, we thank you for it. We thank you for it. If you've been having heart issues like a, um, irregular heartbeats, just put your hand on your heart right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I speak healing to, to the heart. Anyone who's been having heart issues, Lord, let your power begin to touch people's heart and heal irregular heartbeats in Jesus' mighty name. Father, clear out the plaque in the arteries supernaturally in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we speak healing, miraculous healing. Lord, creative miracles in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's somebody named Rob. I believe that God is healing you right now. I don't know if it has to do with that last word I gave, but somebody named Rob, God is healing you right now. Father, we thank you for the power of God present. Rob, tonight's your night. Maybe you're watching live or maybe you're in the room, but God is healing you right now. Father, if you, I, I pray you begin to manifest your presence on Rob that it would be undeniable you're healing him in Jesus' name. The fire of God. Some of you came in here and you, you're, you've been skeptical about the moves of God and, and uh, about if God really does miracles. I believe that tonight you're, you're going to see with your own eyes. Because how many people know Jesus is merciful to the skeptics? He's merciful to the skeptics. Had a doubting disciple. He said, I'm not going to believe unless I stick my hands in the hole, holes of his hand or in his side. And Jesus walks through the wall and says, stick your hand here. He's merciful. Come on, Lord. Just put your hand on your heart one more time. We're going to pray, and then I'll, I'll get into a little bit of the word. Lord, thank you for the miracles that are taking place. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your, the word that you've placed in my heart. Thank you that, Father, tonight's not just a night about preaching or listening, but tonight's a night about participating. That every saint in this room that believes that you've resurrected from the dead, would be empowered to participate, not just tonight, but in a lifestyle of power evangelism. Every single one would understand that by your spirit, they can be a powerful witness. Lord, release the spirit of revelation about our identity as sons and daughters of God, for the whole earth is moaning and groaning, waiting for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. Lord, release the revelation of who you are and who you are in us and who we are as your body in the earth. Lord, I pray for the spirit of truth that would set the captives free from fear, from anxiety, from unbelief. Father, Holy and Holy Spirit... <laughs> Jesus, we love you. We love you. Be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can have a seat if you like. Again, if you get healed tonight at any point, you begin to feel like you're healed 80% or more. It doesn't have to be 100%. Come on, we bless what God's doing in there. Come on, Jesus. 
Raise your hands. We bless that right now. Look at all these healings that are already taking place. We bless the hand in the back there. We bless that healing that's happening over here in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. I was talking to Dan McCullum. Anyone know who Dan McCullum is? It's a prophet, a mighty man of God. He's my favorite prophet, one of my favorite prophets in the world. And uh, I was talking to him before I came in here tonight. And he said, Richie, I feel like you're supposed to demonstrate before you preach. So I did. We just, we're just going to demonstrate, you know. How many people know it's, oftentimes that's what Jesus did. There was a demonstration and then he, he would preach about the kingdom. You know, sometimes he'd preach about the kingdom and then there would be a demonstration. But there was always a demonstration. It wasn't just, uh, you know, preaching. And so I'm, I'm thankful for what God's already starting to do and what he's going to continue to do. How many people have heard me preach before? Just raise your hand. This will help me get an idea of how many people have heard my testimony before. Uh, come on, there's, most of you are fresh, fresh meat. Yeah, awesome. If you've heard it before, you, I think you'll be blessed anyway. I'll share some more of my story. I always like to share a little bit of my story to give glory to God. And because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And uh, I believe it'll create a prophetic environment for God to do it again, not just uh, in your life, but through your life. And uh, so I was born in uh, Newport News, Virginia, where, where I say you can throw a rock and hit three churches by accident. There's churches everywhere, you know, and so I knew a lot about Christ. But how many people know you can know about Christ, but yet not know Christ? And so I knew about Christ because I grew up in a culture where it was kind of cultural Christianity. And uh, my parents were divorced when I was two years old. Um, my dad was from a Baptist background, but was kind of um, the black sheep in the family, wasn't really going to church or following God with his whole heart, but he believed in Jesus. I remember after my parents got a divorce, I was visiting on the weekend, and um, he couldn't pay uh, the bills that weekend, um, so the electricity was cut off and it got cold, so you could see your breath in the air. And um, so he came and got me and my brother. I got a brother. He's a year younger than me and brought us out in the living room, built a, a tent over the couch and, and uh, laid on the couch with us. And we got to sleep with dad that night, you know, under the tent. So, you know, for kids, we don't know the difference. We're like, this is awesome. We get to be with our dad and sleep in the living room, you know, uh, and, and camp in the living room. It was awesome, you know, but I can't imagine the pain that he was going through. You know, he's the first in his family that got a divorce and can't even pay his own bills. And, you know, the, you know, he's in pain. And I remember he got us up in the morning. He put our shoulders together. He said, look me in the eyes, boys. If you have faith in Jesus, you could do anything in this world. And so even though he was broken, even though he didn't fully know what he didn't know, he was only walking in the light that he had, you know, He's, there was still a, a measure of faith that was there, you know. And um, my mom had a traumatic upbringing. I, I, you know, if I, I won't go into her whole story, but she was forced to get an abortion when she was 14 years old. Um, she got pregnant. Her mom made her get an abortion. And because of that, she thought, I'm going to hell, and there's no way I can be saved. And so she would take us to church just to maybe, maybe my kids can get saved, but I'm never going to get saved. And then she would start to get kind of, a little bit of hope, you know, and the Baptist church that we went to at the time, she'd be like, can I do like a single mom's small group or something, a Bible study? And they're like, no, you're, number one, you got a divorce, so you're disqualified. Number two, you're a woman. And, uh, and so she would feel beat down. And um, so she would, you know, go find a man. And, and so her addiction wasn't necessarily drugs or alcohol, but it was men. So we had a rotating door of father figures in and out of our life, or men that would not weren't really fathers, but they were kind of like men in our house. And uh, as a little boy, that developed something in you where you want affirmation from these father figures in your life. And they'll be around for a little while, but then they wouldn't be. And I was good at football. So I got a lot of affirmation during football season. And then when they would break up, I wouldn't see them anymore. At 16 years old, I get angry. Uh, by that time, I'm full-blown drinking three or four nights a week, doing what you do when you're lost all around in the world. Got a reputation as a fighter. I'd fight people. And that's not a good thing if you get a reputation as a fighter, especially if you're scared of fighting, which I was scared of fighting, but I was good at it. And so if you get a reputation as a fighter, 
then fighters search you out to fight you. And you gotta fight all the time. And uh, it was a horrible thing. And I, re- I remember at, by the time I was 16, I had 18 felonies. I was in and out of juvenile detention um, for different things. And I was lost. Say he was lost. He was real lost. Remember, I, when I was in juvenile detention, uh, they had a guy come in there and preach the gospel. And I got to go out to go to chapel. And I remember being moved by the gospel. And, uh, but because when I was 11 years old, I went to a Christmas service. I remember the, my mom took us to a Christmas service. And Dr. James White preached the gospel, amazing man of God, um, at this Baptist church. He preached the gospel. And, and I remember it was just a simple Christmas message. And I was convicted of my sins. And I remember going forward. I was the only one to go forward and respond to the altar call at 11 years old. And I remember he began to, to cry. And it was like I was looking in the eyes of Jesus when he prayed for me. And I, got, and I remember giving my life to the Lord at that time. But I didn't know what I didn't know. We never went back for discipleship. And so Billy Graham says 95% of evangelism is discipleship. How many people think Billy Graham knows a little bit about evangelism? And, uh, and so I didn't get discipleship, so I didn't know what I didn't know. So my example of a Christian was my dad and, you know, a lot of other people in Virginia. You know, they're going to church week after week, but they, they don't really live it outside of church, right? And so in my mind, I'm saved. I got my get-out-of-jail-free card. And so between 11 and 18, I'm sleeping around. I'm fighting. I'm drinking. I might be on my way to fight you praying I win. And I don't feel any conviction about it. You know, I just, I'm only walking in the light that I have. I don't know what I don't know, right? There's a lot of people who are lost and they just don't know what they don't know. See, for me, I didn't wake up in the morning thinking I'm rebelling against God. I just didn't know what I didn't know. I was blind. The blind are blind. They don't know what they don't know. And so I remember at 16 years old, I had a girlfriend. I got out of juvenile detention, but I'm on house arrest. I mean, I got an ankle bracelet on. It's not jewelry. It's got this big box on it, which means I'm out, not allowed out of my house unless I'm going to church or to, to school, which I wasn't allowed at school either. They had me go to a secondary school because of my fighting stuff. So I was only allowed to go to church. So even God was pursuing me even then. I was only allowed to go to church. But I was so lost, I would lie to my PO and say church was three hours and go see my girlfriend when it was only like an hour. But I remember my girlfriend went out with another guy during this time, and, and he took advantage of her when she was drinking and started talking behind her back and talking trash to me. And I was so lost and so angry. I knew I'm going to hurt this dude, but I don't want to hurt this guy because if I do, if I fight this guy and I hurt him, I'm going to have to go back to, to jail, and I don't want to go back to jail. So instead, I went to the school where there was a soccer game to cool off. And I'm there to stay out of trouble. How many people know when you, when you don't know the Lord and you're trying to stay out of trouble, trouble will find you? <laughs> Here I am. I go to there to stay out of trouble, and I'm there watching the soccer game, and a rival high school pulls up with a, with a bunch of guys and one girl in it, and they jump out with togas, you know, like Roman togas. They don't have any clothes on underneath of it or anything, and they're like streaking on the field, just kind of, you know, like streakers do. And they're like doing stuff, and I'm like, these guys are, you know, said something, but it, we're in church. So I said something, you know, and I, but I wasn't going to do anything because I'm there to stay out of trouble. But there was a guy on the soccer team that was from my high school. He said, Richie, my sister's in that crowd. Why don't you punch that dude in the face? I wasn't going to do it because I'm there to stay out of trouble. But I did say something to him, you know, like you guys need to grow up. That's probably not what I said, but I would say I said that. And they started laughing at me, right? And, um, and so I walked up, and I said, laugh now. Took off my shirt. See, sometimes people don't talk about it, but they don't want to be about it. And so I said, laugh now. They all quit laughing except the guy in the front seat. He made a bad choice because his girlfriend was beside him. And I, I walked up, I opened up the door, and I said, laugh now. He made a bad choice. He laughed, and I knocked this dude out, okay? At this point in time, his girlfriend begins to scream. She's a blonde haired girl and she's screaming and she's dialing 911. You ever do something and immediately you're like, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Immediately I'm like, oh, why did I do that? See, because when you don't know the Lord, you don't have any self-control. 
See, the self-control is the fruit of the spirit. I had all kinds of spirits that were manipulating me, you know, at that time. I'm like, why did I do that? And instantly she's dialing 911. I leave. My brother calls me. He's like, Richie, the cops are at the house. They know it's you. Just turn yourself in. I have to go back to jail. So two years later, I get out. I'm already out, you know, two years later. And I end up um, on a paint crew, painting houses. My first paint crew is a bunch of guys that are are addicted to drugs because that's what's in a lot of the trades, right? And by the grace of God, I get switched into another paint crew. It's a bunch of radically saved black dudes. (laughs) They pick me up in the morning blasting Kirk Franklin and wow gospel music. (laughs) Talking about Jesus said this and Jesus said that and Jesus healed sister such and such. And I'm like, what do you mean Jesus said something to you? What do you mean Jesus healed somebody? They're like, yeah, don't you know John 10? My sheep, they hear my voice, and they follow me, and I know them. And it never had occurred to me. See, I knew about Christ, but I didn't know Christ. You see, sometimes people think salvation is that they said a prayer so they can go to heaven. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said this is eternal life, that you would know the Father and the Son whom he sent, right? Right? The only true God and the son whom he sent. That you would know him. Say no. You can't know anyone that you don't talk to but also listen to. See, eternal life is to know him. This is eternal life. So I began to seek the Lord at that point, watching these guys. Now, remember, I lived in Virginia, and up to that point, Even though you can throw a rock and hit three churches by accident, I never recall ever meeting another Christian that was on fire for God. No one ever preached the gospel to me in a grocery store. No one ever preached the gospel to me at school or in anywhere around. All these Christians going about life, but no one's burning. No one's on fire until I meet these guys. Six in the morning, they're blasting their Kirk Franklin. They don't care if I don't want to hear all that. I got a hangover the night before. They don't care. You know why? Because they're in love. The greatest commandment is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, some of it or all of it. All your mind, all your strength, all your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. See, if you love God with all your heart, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So evangelism then isn't necessarily something that we do. It's who we are. You are the light of the world. A city on the hill cannot be hidden. Come on. See, I'm I'm here to actually call people to repentance tonight. See, because it's in the humility of repenting that it's the pleasure of the Holy Spirit to pour out his fire upon you. I'm telling you, listen, if, if your heart's burning, evangelism's a natural overflow. You can't help yourself because you're in love. He's all you're thinking about. Anybody ever been in love before? Come on, I remember falling in love with my wife. I was in YWAM, young women after men. <laughs> yeah, you know. No, honestly, she was there not to be around. Any, she just wanted to go after the Lord. And somehow, somehow we got together. And, and I remember at, when I first met her, I didn't, I didn't think I was supposed to date. You know, because I got, when I got saved, I thought, you know, the reality is that Paul said it's better that you not get married and that you only preach the gospel. And so I'm like a black and white individual. When I got saved, it was like, if he said it, I guess I'm not supposed to get married. And so I thought, you know, when I started getting attracted to this little blue-eyed girl from Canada, it was a, it was a distraction from the devil. And I remember thinking, oh, God, I would pray, God, you got to get this girl out of my mind, you know, help me. And I'd think about her again. I'd be like, get behind me, Satan, you know, like. (laughs) And I struggled with it for a long time because I couldn't quit thinking about this girl. And eventually I'm like, God, you got to help me. I feel like I'm going crazy. And he said, that's right, because you're crazy about her. And he said it in a way that was good, you know, it was okay. And, And I remember thinking, you know, earlier on in the book, God said it's not good. That man should be alone. I think I'm going to listen to God the Father. (laughs) 
But I remember going to Australia, man, right after we started dating, and it was like, man, I would wake up at 2 in the morning because it's a different time zone. And I would, back then, I didn't have a cell phone. Like, they had these little calling cards. You pay, like, $20 to get, like, an hour. Anybody remember those? And you went to the pay phone, and you had to dial in this long code to call. And I would spend all my money. See, it's youth without any money. Why wham, right? I spent all my money to get these cards and call her at 2 in the morning. I wouldn't even sleep, and my ear would hurt. You ever talk to somebody on the phone so long, your ear sweats and it hurts? Like, my ear would hurt. I would talk to her for so long. See, that's like our prayer life. Sometimes, sometimes when you don't love God with all your heart, prayer is a discipline. But when you're in love, you can't help yourself. Couldn't quit thinking about her. See, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. See, if, if God is dominating your mind, he's all you're talking about. Amen? Say, I can be a witness. Evangelism's not just for the evangelist. It's for the believer. It's for the one that's in love. It's the Holy Spirit that comes upon us that empowers us to be witnesses. So back up a little bit. I'm at my painting job. These guys are demonstrating for me what it is to be on fire. They're a living witness. They're a living epistle for me. I'm, they're being read by me and by all men. They love the Lord. And it causes me to begin to pursue the Lord. I'm, I'm driving over the Coleman Bridge in Yorktown, Virginia. It connects Yorktown, Virginia to Gloucester, Virginia. For those history guys, you know that's where we want our independence. And so... And in the morning when I would go to work, I'd cross from Gloucester to Yorktown, and I would see the sun rising in the morning. And it was beautiful for like three days. I remember it was like the first time I ever seen the sunrise. And in the evening, I would be coming home, and the sun would be setting on the other side of the river. And I remember thinking, this is so beautiful. It's like, God, you're showing off to me now. And on the third day, I remember looking at that sunrise glistening off the river See, Psalm 19 says, day unto day utter speech, night unto night knowledge. The sun is like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber, running its race from one end of heaven to the other and nothing's hidden from its heat. Goes on to talk about how the skies are like evangelists in the earth. And this is what happened to me. As that's happening, I'm looking at that sunrise glistening off the river. I just had this thought. And I thought about all the pain my mom had been through, all the pain my dad had been through, all the pain that I'd already seen in my own life, girls who betrayed me, all kinds of pain and suffering. And I thought, there's no guarantee that I'll have joy in this world. There's no guarantee. Except the fish in this river were created for a purpose. They were created to be in the river. And if they're on the bank, number one, they're not gonna live, but number two, they're not gonna be fulfilled. All of a sudden, it hit me. Hold on, you created me for a purpose as well. And I'm guaranteed to live fulfilled if I fully submit my life to the plan and the purpose that you have for me. God, you're looking at my heart right now. You know I'm weak, and I can't do this on my own. This is my prayer. You know I'm weak. I can't do this on my own. You know who I am. You know everything about me. Lord, I really want to follow you. Lord, I really want to fulfill the plan you have for my life. And as I began to pray and weep in that moment, it was like somebody dumped 10,000 gallons of liquid love over me. And I was radically born again in that moment. I started weeping and crying and weeping and crying. And immediately... I didn't know anything. Listen, I didn't know. I knew John 3.16 from when I was a little kid going to church on Christmas and Easter sometimes, you know. I knew John 3.16, and I knew my testimony, and I knew how to buy you a cheeseburger. And I would buy people cheeseburgers, share John 3.16 and my testimony, and people started getting saved. I was sharing the gospel left and right. Immediately, my life became a witness. See, so many people are crying out for more when they're not even being faithful with what they've been given. How many people know there is more? If you don't know there is more, there's a book out there on a table written by a really amazing man of God called There Is More. And you can read all about it. But there is more, and I believe that there is more, and I believe that God wants you to have more than you want more. But God is a good investor. And he's not a lip reader, he's a heart reader. And if you're faithful... With what God has given you, he'll give you more. Sometimes sovereignly, he'll just choose to do it anyway. 
But I find that the people who are being faithful with what they've been given and have determined in their heart, if you touch me, I'll go anywhere you tell me to go. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I'll go across the street. I'll, I'll go to the, to the crack houses. I'll go to China. I'll go wherever you want me to go, I'll go. And you mean it from your heart. It's like they're magnets for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They're magnets for God to give them more to. How many people want more tonight? No matter what the cost, Lord, we want more. Amen? So I get radically saved, right? God tells me to go to this little Baptist church, First Baptist Church, the church where I got saved. I didn't want to go there at first because, you know, in that church it was all just hymns and stuff like that and mainly older people. I wanted to go be with the younger people and, you know, and sing rock and roll music and stuff. And, and the Lord said, no, I want you to go there. Because when the, I believe God sent me there for a few reasons. One of them is when the Baptists meet, we eat. <laughs> the Baptist church I went to, there was a potluck before and after every single <laughs> meeting you did. So they know how to do family, right? And I needed a family. I need to get plugged into a family. See, this is how people are discipled. We're supposed to be a family. When people get born again, they're supposed to be fathered and mothered and have brothers and sisters come around them. Amen. <laughs> There's no shortcut to discipleship, it happens at your dinner table when you're eating, amen? We can do all kinds of programs, but it's not as effective as if you invite people to your house and you're hospitable. Come on. Matter of fact, if you're going to be a leader in the body of Christ, you must be hospitable, according to Paul, by the Holy Spirit, amen? Come on. And so he sent me there to learn about family. He sent me there as well because the Baptists, they love the word, the Bible, right? So I got a foundation in the Bible. Another reason he sent me there. My first Bible study, where I went in there right after I got saved. They're reading John 1. And I'm reading that, and I just got saved. And I'd never, my eyes had never been opened until that moment. This is the word of God. And I'm like, how do you only read one chapter? We read for an hour and discussed it, and I feel the presence of God, and they're going to go home. I'm like, No. See, when you're on fire and you're on love, reading the Bible isn't something you have to do. This, I mean, some, some, some people need to get revived, and you know it because reading your Bible has become a discipline. Come on, I'm telling you, this is the word of God. <laughs> like, I'm not against the disciplines, but I mean, I just like, ah, man, I just like to burn for it. You know, when you read it and you're like, man, this is... Every word that proceeds out of his mouth. Jesus said, I don't say anything of my own accord. I only say what the Father says. And that my word is spirit and it's truth. And they said when he was speaking to us, did our hearts not burn within us? Lord, may when we read the Bible, our hearts burn within us, Lord. Cause our hearts to burn. I remember that night I'm reading that John. I'm like, please, somebody stay with me and keep reading with me. And one girl and one guy stayed with me. And they stayed with me all night. We, we read that night all the way. We probably got to John 15, reading verse by verse. And by the end of it, the, 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 um, the janitor came up to us and said, hey, guys, can, can you guys, like, please go across the street to the Waffle House and keep reading? And I want to go home and be with my family. And so we did. We went across the street to the Waffle House, and we're reading in the Waffle House the Bible. And suddenly the girl looks up at me, and she says, hey, Richie, uh, were you at a soccer game two years ago? She has blonde hair, I realize. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> and I got embarrassed, you know. And she's like, comes up and taps me on the shoulder. She says, oh, don't worry about it, Richie. That day I started praying for your soul. Her name was Catherine Oder. Don't ever discount the power of your prayer life as it pertains to power evangelism. How many people want to see souls saved? What's going to empower you is going to be on your knees when you begin to experience the heart of the Father. See, if you understood his heart as a father, you would understand his heart for souls. That's why when Jesus is talking about there's more joy in heaven over one soul repenting, he's talking about a story of a superstar father not the prodigal son. The story is not about the prodigal son. The story is about the superstar father. See, if you get the heart of the father, you get his compassion, you get his heart for souls. And if you get his heart for souls and you begin to weep in prayer, evangelism will be the natural overflow of your life. 
Amen? I don't believe anyone comes into the kingdom apart from prayer at some way or another. This is a church that prays. I can feel it. I was listening to the testimony of the pastor and how he was in the room when young E. Cho just began to weep for 45 minutes. I believe God wants to do that again in this house. I believe God wants to sovereignly touch your heart to where you begin to be a people that weep. How many people want that? How many people want to experience the, the compassion of God, the tears that come just from the Lord? Lord, we ask for tears. Come on, the Lord's not a lip reader, he's a heart reader. Father, we ask for compassion in this place, that we would have compassion for those who are lost. Lord, I ask that you would release an impartation for compassion, that there would be compassion that would lead to action, Lord. Lord, release compassion for those who are living in addiction, God. They're so broken. They're so ashamed. They don't know what they don't know. They're only walking in the light that they have, and they're, 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 they're afraid, and they're scared. Release compassion for the girl who's pregnant, and she doesn't know how she's going to take care of the baby, God, and she's ashamed to go home and tell her parents, and she's going to go get an abortion because she's ashamed. God, release compassion, Lord. Release compassion, Lord, to the, to the ones that are in gangs, God. Release compassion to the ones who don't have fathers, and so they join Join gangs, God. It can release compassion to your body, Lord, that we would not be those who judge those who are lost like, like so many do, God. But we want to be those who have compassion like you did. You gave your life not for those who are well, but for those who are sick. Lord, I'm asking for a compassion to be released in this house. Lord, that when you begin to touch people by your Holy Spirit, Lord, that there would be an impartation that comes from your heart of compassion, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Lord, I bless the tears. If you're beginning to cry right now, I just want you to put your hands up. If anyone just begin to cry, and you don't have to cry, but I just want to bless what God's doing. Holy Spirit, I just bless the tears right now. In Jesus' name, increase, 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 increase. God, tenderize our hearts in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for that. You guys doing okay? Come on. Come on. I'm going to share a message that God told me to speak around the world, especially when I go into places for the first time. And I believe that God's going to baptize many people with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I was on an airplane years ago on my way to uh, the Azusa Now Gathering. Anybody heard about that with Lou Engle? He was celebrating the Azusa Street Revival, and I remember I was flying in, and I heard the Lord say, I want you to stand up and read Matthew 5 out loud on the airplane. How many people know slow obedience is disobedience? <laughs> I want to tell you something. You have an advantage. Say, I have an advantage. John 15, Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I go away, I'm going to send to you a helper. I'm not going to leave you an orphan. I'm going to send to you a helper. It's the Holy Spirit. He said, it's better for you that I go away. How many people know that? That is an incredible statement that he said. It's better for you. I want you to consider you're the disciples and you've seen Jesus Raise the dead. How many people think that would help your faith to see somebody raised from the dead? Like you've seen water turn into wine. Peter walked on water. Peter, James, and John got to see Jesus transfigured on the mount, shine like the sun with Moses and Elijah. I heard the father say, this is my son in whom I'm, you know, well pleased. They heard that at his baptism. This is my son. Hear him. Like how many people think that stuff would help your faith a little bit? Just a little bit? Like they... All the miracles that they did, John said they wouldn't even, all the books in the world wouldn't even contain them. That's how many miracles they saw. Like, big advantage to their faith, right? If you still don't believe it, when you get to heaven, I want you to talk to the sons of thunder and ask them about the time they were going through the town of Samaria, right? And no one was being hospitable. And so the sons of thunder come to Jesus and they say, hey, you want us to call down fire from heaven like Elijah? Notice they didn't say, do you want to call down fire? And they said, you want us to call down fire from heaven. Listen, they understood their authority. I don't think I know one Christian who actually thinks they can call down fire on a city and it actually happened. And that's probably a good thing. 
we probably wouldn't have New York City or Las Vegas or California be burned up by now. Like, But it was a good thing because Jesus was with them, right? They understood their authority. They understood the word like Elijah did. Look, there's precedence in the Bible. They understood the word. I think there's a lot of people who might understand their authority. They might understand some of the Bible, but good for them. Jesus was their advantage that day, right? He says to them, not a good idea, boys. This is my, you know, my version. Not a good idea, boys. You don't know what spirit you're of. See, some people might know the word. They might know the, the authority, but they don't know what spirit they're of. For the son of man did not come to what? Kill men's lives. He came to what? Save men's lives. How many people know that Jesus was an advantage in their life that day because they obeyed him? They didn't say, whatever, Jesus. It's in the Bible. Fire! And call down fire anyway. You're like, that's ridiculous. Who's going who's gonna to disobey Jesus? No one's going to disobey Jesus. And yet, Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I do, I'll send to you the Holy Spirit. They ask you a question, how often... Have you disobeyed the Holy Spirit? And yet Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away. I'll send to you the Holy Spirit. You know how we take advantage of our advantage, which is the Holy Spirit? Quick obedience. Quick obedience. You don't rationalize it away. You don't think, well, I, 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 you know, I'm an introvert. You know, you're an extrovert, Richie. People tell me that about evangelism. You know, I'm an introvert. You're an extrovert. You know, I, I. You know, I, I'm kind of more of a prophet. You're an evangelist. You know, I kind of encourage people. I'm kind of more of a pastor. You're an evangelist. You know, you, you get them saved and then I'll clean them up, you know, kind of thing. I, 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 I. You hear all this I, 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 I thing? See, but I thought it wasn't about you. I thought it's no longer your life that you live, but it's Christ who lives in you. It's not longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, Right? It's not about you. See, when you get saved, you get baptized. You're supposed to get baptized. And when you get baptized, you die with Christ, right? You get under the water, you die with Christ. And when you come out of that water, you resurrect a new creation. And it's no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. Come on. Oftentimes, oftentimes, um, these excuses are just fear masquerading as a personality type. It doesn't need to look like Todd White or Chris Overstreet or anybody else, you know. It just needs to look like you, fully confident that Christ is on the inside of you. Sometimes it's Christ in your personality type and who you are and in your experience of life that's going to impact people. It might not work if Todd went up to him. Come on. But ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit that convinces people that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead and is the Lord. No one says that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. We just partner with him. Amen? And so oftentimes, if you want to see authority, if you want to receive power and, and actually see power demonstrated through your life, you simply just need to obey what God has said in his word and go into all the world and preach. Say preach which means proclaim with words, come on, and preach the gospel. And as you preach the gospel, the Holy Spirit backs you up. Come on. Even if your words are not wise and persuasive, he backs you up because you believe and he's with you. Amen? So I'm in this airplane and God says, get up and read out loud Matthew 5 on the airplane. Slow obedience is disobedience. I know what it says. It says, neither they light a lamp and place it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand that it would give light to all who are in the house. Therefore, let your good works shine before men that they would glorify your Father in heaven. I know what it says. But when it came out, it said, neither do they light a lamp and place it under a basket of fear. It doesn't say fear. But it came out fear. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. He said, I want you to tell the church everywhere that you go that there's a cost to putting your light under a basket of fear. And he reminded me of a story that happened just years prior. I'm in a cafe. 
drinking coffee, liquid heaven in a cup. I'm not there on outreach. I'm there just having coffee with my friend Tom. We get out of the cafe, and I notice there's a couple screaming and yelling at each other. The spit is flying. Her net vein is bulging out. I mean, it's a bad argument, right? Basic emotional intelligence tells you leave them alone. This is not really a good time to start a conversation with them, right? But I have a core belief that there's not a problem in the world that doesn't have a solution. And I might not know what it is, but the, my best friend does. My advantage does. See, look at your neighbor and say, I'm not the best evangelist. Say, Billy Graham was not the best evangelist. Todd White's not the best evangelist. Now look at your neighbor and say, but my best friend is. See, the Holy Spirit's the greatest evangelist. So I've learned that if I want to see the supernatural, here's the key to walking in a lifestyle of the supernatural. If you want to walk in a lifestyle of the supernatural, you got to put yourself in situations to where if God doesn't show up, it ain't going to turn out very good. you got to step across the chicken line. Come on. you got to go to the edge of your ability and let him add his super to your natural. And so I don't know what the problem is here, but... I just walk up to the window, and I knock on the window. At this point in time, I realize the dude is huge. He's big. He's got muscles upon muscles. He looks like Mr. Clean or The Rock, you know, like with tattoos on his face and neck. And I used to be a fighter, but I don't think I can take this dude. And he's like, what? He's looking at me, what? And I'm like, man, I feel fear. Right? My heart is racing. I feel fear. I don't want to fight this dude. And I'm like, man, God, you got to speak something to me. See, I, I don't even know what I'm going to say. I knocked on the window. I didn't even know what I was going to say. Right? Sometimes people want God to speak to you before you step out. But oftentimes he's waiting for you to step out. And when you step out, that's when he's going to speak to you. God, 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 God. I'm like emergency tongues on the inside. I don't know if anybody know what I'm talking about. I'm like, oh, God, 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 you got to tell me something. You got to tell me something. You got to tell me something. If you don't tell me something, I'm going to make it up. <laughs> See, sometimes you think you're making it up, but you're not because you've been given the mind of Christ. And sometimes words of knowledge come like a simple thought, <laughs> right? Sometimes you think it's your thought, but it's not. Sometimes it is your thought. But listen, if we never step out and trust that we're hearing God, we, we can't gain discernment. See, if you step out in love, you can't be wrong even if you're wrong. Because love never fails. Right? You have no idea how many times I've seen people come into the kingdom, get saved, or get healed through a wrong word of knowledge. What's that look like? I walk up to them, and I'm like, hey, man, you got a pain in your shoulder? I'm at a grocery store. You got pain in your shoulder, huh? He's like, no. <laughs> Why you ask that? Oh, don't worry about it. How about your ankle? You got pain in your ankle? <laughs> no, I got pain in my ankle. You're weird, man. Get away from me. I'm like, ah. How about your back? You got pain in your back? <laughs> no, I got pain in my back. Get away from me, dude. I'm like, oh, man, I'm... Listen, man, I'm a, I'm a Christian, man. I'm just kind of a baby Christian. You know, I'm learning how to hear God's voice. I don't always hear him right, but sometimes I do. And when I do, people get healed, man. Oh, that's cool. I got pain in my neck. You think you'll heal my neck? <laughs> sure, I pray for their neck. And their neck gets healed, and they get saved all through a wrong word of knowledge. <laughs> how many people are willing to look like a fool? in order to see people get saved and healed, man. Listen, it ain't about us. See, when it becomes not about you anymore, when, it, listen, listen, I'm not worried about being laughed at. I'm not worried about getting it wrong because I love this person. I'm going to step out and believe I hear God. See, and I believe that most of the time I'm going to get it right because I'm a child of God. So many people, they think, man, maybe this is God. It's probably just me. Listen, you'll get it wrong a lot that way. You won't step out very much that way. If you switch it, just have a little switch. It's probably God, but it might be me. Then you'll step out more often and have more faith. Why should you believe that? Because you're a child of God. You were created to hear your father's voice. And because the secret place is the practice place for the marketplace. 
And so I'm in the secret place spending time with the Lord, cultivating intimacy with God. And so, of course, when I'm out and my motivation is to love, I'm not there to build myself up. I'm not there to get a testimony. I'm there to reconcile people to the Father. This is my motivation. Of course, he's going to speak through me. And yes, sometimes I might get it wrong. But even if I get it wrong, he's powerful enough to cover my mistakes. Amen? Amen. See, I don't want to just tell you a testimony. I want to equip. See, because this is the role of the evangelist to equip the saints for the work of ministry. It's the saints who do the work of ministry, though. Amen? And so I knock on the window. God, you got to tell me something. You got to tell me something. You got to tell me something. If you don't tell me something, I'll make it up. I just hear this slight thought. Ask him about his daughter. So I say, hey, the guy, I said, roll down the window. I'm stalling. You know, he's like, ah, he's rolling down the window. I'm like, man, I don't mean to be disrespectful or anything, you know, but I'm a, I know you're arguing, but I'm a Christian. And when I saw you arguing, I felt like the Lord told me to tell you, uh, to ask you about your daughter and to tell you that you're important to her life. And the guy just begins to weep and cry on the spot. And on the inside, I went, yes. <laughs> He's like weeping, right? He's like, ah, oh, you know, like, like really weeping. Like, and his wife is weeping, and I'm like, what's going on? They can't even talk. They're beside themselves. After a few minutes, they come out of it. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, well, today we were going to commit couple suicide. And we were arguing about what we were going to do with our daughter after we were gone. I was able to share my testimony about hope of Jesus. And instead of killing themselves, they got born again. You see, there's a cost to putting your light under a basket of fear. People's lives are at stake. It's not about you. Courage inspires courage. My friend Tom was with me. Remember that? He sees this happen, and he looks for the first moving target in the parking lot. He's like, I got to go share something about Jesus with somebody. And he sees this guy walking across the parking lot with the headphones in, and he's smoking a cigarette. And my friend's like, hey, stop. And either the guy's ignoring him or can't hear him. And my friend Tom takes off across the parking lot running after this dude. (laughs) Courage inspires courage. You don't know if you step out who you're going to encourage to step out. Oftentimes, every giant killer in the Bible hung out with giant killers. Tom runs after this guy, taps him on the shoulder, The guy's like, what? What do you want? My friend Tom doesn't know what he's going to (laughs) say. He hasn't thought about it that far. You want to know another key to seeing the supernatural released? Listen, trust me, this is very simple. It's a practical tool for those who like practical things. Tell your testimony or tell a testimony. It doesn't even have to be your personal testimony. Maybe it's somebody got healed at church. You might say, hey, man, I just want to tell you, you know, I see healings all the time. You're not lying. You saw what happened at church. You know, you might watch YouTube videos of people being healed at Global Awakening or Bethel. And, you know, you just watch the videos over and over and over and over. And you say, hey, man, I see healings all the time. Jesus heals people all the time. And you tell them a testimony. It's not, it's not being uh, unhonest. It's a family testimony. You're testifying of what you've seen Jesus do. Amen. My friend Tom, he don't know what he's going to say. And so he tells a testimony. So you got to be locked and loaded with testimonies all the time. How did he provide? Anybody know Jesus as provider? How many people know that's a powerful testimony to share right now? There's a lot of people with inflation and everything going on that are worried about finances. And you can just break out a testimony of Jesus the provider and then link it to Jesus the Savior. Because he's a good father who provides. Amen? Come on. So when you don't know what to say, tell a testimony. And as you do, you create an atmosphere of the prophetic. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. See, you don't have a a worship band creating an atmosphere for the glory when you're out in the streets. But it doesn't mean you can't create an atmosphere. This is authority. Say authority. So I might not feel anything, but I'm creating a wave. Because God said, go into the world, and with his authority, he's given me authority, I'm creating an atmosphere, amen? So my friend Tom, he goes up to this guy, he says, the guy's like, what? He's like, you'll never believe what just happened over there. (laughs) And he tells this guy what just happened in the car. It's a testimony. And the guy starts weeping. 
The guy, after he's done weeping, he's, my friend Tom's like, what's going on? The guy said, I was on my way to kill myself right now. It's three people in 20 minutes were going to commit suicide. But God had two sons there drinking coffee that weren't going to bow down to the spirit of fear. I believe that God tonight wants to baptize people in the Holy Spirit, but I also believe he wants to deliver people from the spirit of fear. Because God spoke to me, he said the main basket that the church puts their light under is a basket of fear. Perfect love casts out fear. See, if, you, if I share a bunch of stories, which I can share stories all night long about how God is touching people and getting saved and miracles that take place out, you might get inspired and you might be like, man, I want to go preach the gospel. And if you go and you're just gritting your teeth, I want to be a good Christian and preach the gospel, it won't last very long. But if you go baptized in the love of God, motivated by the love of God, motivated by the compassion of God, motivated by the spirit of God, baptizing your heart, this thing will become a lifestyle, not something you have to do, something you can't help yourself but to do. If you go with the fire of God, see, God is an all-consuming fire. John says, I baptize you with water unto repentance, but there's one who's coming, he's greater than me. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with what? Fire. Fire. The context is repentance. I'm baptizing you with water into repentance. They say, are you the Christ? He says, I'm not Christ. But when he comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Context is repentance. Our God is an all-consuming fire context. They were worshiping idols. Right? Moses comes down, sees them worshiping idols. The Lord... Killing people, it's old covenant, right? And we hear God is an all-consuming fire. He's a jealous God, worshiping idols, right? Holy Spirit fire falls in New Testament, Acts chapter 2, right? 3,000 people died in the old, in the new, 3,000 people get saved. Because the law brings death, but the Spirit brings what? Life. Fire falls upon their hearts. Our God is an all-consuming fire. He's a jealous God. He's not jealous because he's insecure. Love always has the highest and best for what it's pointed at. Anything that's an idol in our life is less than the highest and best for our life. God's jealous for you to have the highest and best and nothing less. See, there's a lot of people whose witness isn't um, being shared because of compromise. Little snakes. And compromise is stealing the voice of the church but it's the spirit of holiness when the spirit of holiness and fire comes upon our hearts. See, Acts chapter one, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be a what? A witness. His name is Holy Spirit. He's a spirit because God is a spirit, but his name is holy. When that spirit of holiness comes upon us, that spirit of fire, that spirit of love comes upon us, man, I'm telling you, it causes us to repent of every other thing. That's, that we love, not God. Amen? That's not God. And it's in that place of humility and repentance that I believe the fire of God falls. His love falls on us. Listen, when we realize he loved us while we were yet still sinners, not because we had it all together, he loves us while we were yet still sinners. He chose us. And we come in humility and we say, Father, I want you to baptize my heart. I want to be a witness. Amen? He loves you. He loves you just because he loves you. I'm going to tell you one more story, and we're going to pray and just do some ministry. Is that okay? He loves you just because he loves you just because he loves you just because he loves you. I had a guy that I was discipling in YWAM. I did YWAM after I got saved, and I was discipling this dude in YWAM. He was a young guy. He's only 15 years old at the time when I met him. He's from a rough background. His... his um, Brothers were in gangs. His dad was in jail. His mom was a heroin addict. And uh, rough, rough background. His grandparents bought him a PlayStation gaming system when he was 15 years old. And it was his escape from the pain of his life. He goes to school, 
gets out of school, comes home, his gaming system is gone. He can't find his gaming system anywhere. It goes all over the house, goes into his mother's room. When he gets into his mother's room, he sees that she's ODing on drugs. She had sold his gaming system to go get her drugs. So he calls the police. He calls his brothers who were in the gangs. The brothers beat the paramedics to the, uh, to the house. They see him in the fetal position in the corner, and he's crying in the corner in the fetal position. They say, get up, get up. Social services is going to come pick you up. Get up, come with us. Stop that crying. He can't quit crying because he's witnessed his mama there o- overdosing. So because he can't quit crying, they, they start beating him. Man up. This is life. Man up. See, people are only walking in the light that they have, and there's a cost to putting your light under a basket of fear. Somebody's going to go home and beat their wife tonight because they don't know what they don't know. They're only walking in the light that they have. This stuff is happening all over the pain that's in the world, all over the place, all the time. And Christians are just going to church, going through the motions. It's not to bring condemnation. It's actually to call us to this place of humility and repentance to realize why are we coming to empowered? We're coming to empower, to receive power to be a witness. So that we can become a solution to these hells that people are living in all over Tampa Bay. Amen. All over wherever you're coming from. Here he is and they're beating him. And he decides that day, I'll never cry again. I'm going to be a real man. So fast forward, I'm discipling, and the Holy Spirit starts moving in our midst. And some people are crying, and some people are falling down, and some people are shaking. And, and he's over here doing this. <clears throat> and I'm thinking, that's a weird Holy Spirit manifestation, man. I lived in Bethel before at Reading, and I'm like, man, I've seen some stuff. That's kind of weird. And I just leave him alone, and he's like, mm, 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 like doing this stuff. And... Um, a few days go by, and I say, hey, man, how come every time the Holy Spirit starts moving, you do this thing? Is that the Holy Spirit? And he's like, nah, man, that's how I stop my tears. And he told me the story of what I just told you. I take him into the bathroom, and I say, Rich, I want you to look into this mirror, and I want you to read this, this word. I'm going to read this word to you. And he looked into the mirror in the bathroom, and I read him the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. And I read to him how Paul, with many tears, was, would pray. And man after man, and the David, and the Psalms, and, the pray, and the, all these men of God weeping. And at the end, I said, I want you to know something. And I'm going to tell you what I told him. I said, I want you to know something. Jesus Christ loves you because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, just because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, just because he loves you, 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 just because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you. I want you to know he loves you just because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you. Because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, because he loves you, just because he loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. He's always loved you, he's always gonna love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. He loves you. And Richard began to weep. And he went from the guy who never weeps to the guy who always cries. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You, know, you guys know somebody like that. You just say the name of Jesus, and they're like, oh. He was that guy, man. I love those guys, man, because those guys typically are the ones who are the most on fire, man. They are tender for the Lord, man. I mean, and that's how Richard was. I mean, he would go, and he would go leave the, the conference, this conference. He would leave and go lead, lead 15 people to Jesus and bring them back, man. He was on fire, and he was a leader, so he was leading everybody else to the Lord, Till about two weeks from the end of the school, he started rebelling. See, what I didn't realize is that he had been abandoned by every father figure in his life, just kind of like I was. And I didn't realize it, but because he had been abandoned by them, he had decided I was like a father figure to him. He was going to abandon me before I could abandon him. And so he started to rebel on purpose, and I didn't realize it. He just started getting in trouble over and over, doing really bad stuff. And he was taking everybody else in the school down with him. And I got to send these students back to their parents. And I'm like, man, I got to send him home because he's messing everybody else up. And it's breaking my heart. He's my favorite student, but I'm going to send him home. 
And I go to the other leader and I said, man, I got I to gotta send him home. I'm so glad for her because she knew the Father's heart of God. See, we give up on people way too easy. Love never fails. Love never fails. It never gives up. We give up on people. The disciples said, how many times do we have to forgive? Jesus says, seven times 70. In other words, until it's complete. She said, no, Richie, one more chance. Give him another chance. I said, all right, one more chance. I go down to where this young man was, and I said, hey, why are you doing this, man? I love you. And he exploded at me. I don't even know what love is. You say you love me. You say God loves me. You say love, 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 all this love. I don't even know what love is. And I'm so glad for my advantage, the Holy Spirit, because I explode right back in his face. And I say, Richard, there's a gun right here. One of your gangbanger brother's friends has a gun. Either you're going to take the bullet or I'm taking the bullet. Who's taking the bullet? And he began to look away. I said, no, Richard, look me in the eyes. Who's taking the bullet? You or me? And he began to weep. He said, Richie, I take that bullet for you. I said, don't you dare tell me you don't know what love is. You just love me. <laughs> love looks like something. Unless you sacrifice yourself, you can't love. What the Lord told me in my dream last night. This is your message for tonight. It's to follow the way, the truth, and the life. It's to follow love. Love looks like a man hanging on a cross. He's God. Love looks like God beaten, bruised, bleeding, abandoned by all his friends and family, being mocked, marred beyond recognition. And he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is what love looks like. And he's calling us to follow him, the way, the truth, and the life. He's calling you, he's calling me to say, I want to follow Jesus. See, if you try to save your life, you'll lose your life. But if you lose your life for my sake, then you'll find your life. If you want to be my disciple, you got to take up your cross and follow me. Amen? This is what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to lay down our life. He's calling you to a fresh surrender. He's calling you to put your life on the altar. And as you put your life on the altar and you lay down your life, it's his good pleasure to pour out his fire upon you, upon your heart. Amen. God wants to pour out his fire tonight. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Fear is the spirit that you've not been given. Apostle Paul says, you've not been given a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've been given a spirit of adoption by whom you cry out, Abba, Father. Fear is the spirit. Another place, you've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. Most places it calls fear a spirit that you've not been given. It's not your master. It's not who you are. It's not who we listen to. You've been given the spirit of holiness, the spirit of love. As many who are led by the spirit of God are the sons and daughters of God. Amen. He's the spirit that we follow. The Lord wants to set us free from the spirit of fear. See, the righteous are as bold as a lion. And you're righteous not by your own works, but as Abraham believed it unto God and it was accounted to him righteousness, we believe on Jesus and it is counted to us righteousness. Say, I'm righteous. And according to Proverbs, the righteous are as bold as a lion. Say, I'm as bold as a lion. I want you to stand to your feet if you're able. And uh, if the band wants to come up, you don't need to play yet because I'm going to play a video first, but that, I'm going to need you afterwards. The righteous are as bold as a lion. I remember as I was sharing this message years ago, I felt like the Lord said, I want you to get the church to do a prophetic act in faith. I want you to get them to roar. Obviously, we're not lions. We're going we're gonna to shout with our whole heart. 
But I want you to roar. I want you to shout with everything you have in a minute because the righteous are as bold as a lion. And what we're doing in this moment is it's a prophetic act because oftentimes people like to be like kitty cats. They don't like to be like lions. In this moment, there's a, be a temptation to kind of be reserved. But I want to encourage you, don't be reserved. I want this to be a thing between you and the Lord. You're saying, no longer will I submit to the spirit of fear. There's a cost to putting my light under a basket of fear. I'm going to testify of the, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm going to testify to the love of God. I'm going to testify that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. I'm going to put my, my, all my money, I'm going to put all my life on the altar, and I'm going to follow Jesus with everything I got. I'm not going to be afraid anymore because I've not been given a spirit of fear. I've been given a spirit of power. I've been given a spirit of love. I've been given a spirit of a sound mind. I want you to just begin to roar. Begin to roar. Freedom! 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 In Jesus' name, bring freedom, Lord. Baptize in your Holy Spirit. Baptize with fire. Baptize with your power, Lord. Baptize with your love, Lord. In Jesus' name, release freedom. 